Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored uh, from New York City. Uh, tonight, an exclusive interview with a man who almost changed the world and who some people believe should still be locked up in prison for the rest of his life. It was 30 seconds and six bullets that changed American history. <laughs> on March the 30th, 1981, a man opened fire on President Reagan as he left the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. A bullet ricocheted off the president's limo and lodged within an inch of his heart, almost killing him. Reagan's press secretary, James Brady, was paralyzed for life. The gunman was John Hinckley Jr. The mentally ill 25-year-old was obsessed with a young actress, Jodie Foster. Depressed and delusional, he thought killing the president could win her affections. After 12 days in hospital, Reagan made a full recovery, serving two terms as one of America's most popular ever presidents. Hinckley was found not guilty of attempted murder by reason of insanity, but spent 30 years in psychiatric care and another 10 under close supervision. This year, he was granted full freedom. The whole world knows his name and what he did. Tonight, they'll hear his story, and it's uncensored. Well, John Hinckley Jr. rejoins me now. John Hinckley, uh, thank you again for coming on the programme. I appreciate it. And you said that you want to change, I guess, people's perceptions if they have a negative view of you. Just to take you back to that day when Ronald Reagan was, was shot by you, along with three other people, what memories do you have of your actions that day? Uh, Piers, I just remember I was at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and I, I happened to ha have the, uh, the newspaper before me. I saw the president's schedule for that day, and uh, that's where I, how I knew where he would be that day. And I think I, went, I think I went and got some breakfast, and then I went up to the hotel... And in those days, it was easy to get pretty close to a president. Of course, that's all changed now, but um, back then, it was pretty easy to get close to the president, and unfortunately, I was able to go through with the crime. Do you remember actually firing your gun? Not, not anymore, no, I don't. Your motivation at the time... Uh, albeit you, it was decided that you were suffering from severe mental illness, so not responsible uh, directly for your actions, was that you'd become obsessed with the movie star Jodie Foster after watching the movie Taxi Driver, in which a character does actually plot to assassinate a presidential candidate. Do you recall any of your feelings about Jodie Foster that would lead you... you know, I think you were trying to impress her by doing this, but do you recall the, the build-up of feelings that you had about her that would lead you to do such an extreme act? Well, I mean, I had first seen her, I believe, in the movie Taxi Driver, and that was in 1976, I believe. And uh, this obsession that I developed just kind of built over the next several years to where in 1980, uh, she went off to college at Yale University and I went to Yale to uh, follow her and tr try and find her. And uh, that just didn't turn out. That turned out badly. And so uh, I just kind of, my thinking just went very um, negative, And that's why I went ahead with the shooting. What do you feel about Jodie Foster today? Well, I have very kind feelings for her. You know, I'm so I've I've apologized to her for bringing into all of this, and I just wish her a very good life. There will be a lot of people, uh, John Hinckley, who will have just heard the last few minutes of what you've been saying and felt a chill go up their spine that somebody could stalk a major celebrity for several years. I think at one stage you also stalked uh, Jimmy Carter before you fired these fateful shots at, at President Reagan, which were well, fateful for at least one of the people you shot, James Brady, who ended up dying many years later from his injuries. But they'll feel a chill at their spine thinking, somebody that could do all this, have such a dangerous obsession that led to such dangerous stalking, and then the ultimate act of danger of trying to assassinate a, a, an American president, that that person should never be released. 
and there's been a lot of anger since you were given full freedom. Um, what do you feel about that? I mean, do you feel yourself that you, it is right that you should be released? I mean, I'll give you an analogy. Mark Chapman shot John Lennon, I think, a year before you. He remains incarcerated with no real sign of, of being released at all. But that's because he killed Lennon. But at least one of the people you shot died as a result of those injuries years later. Do you see a distinction between the two of you, between you and Mark Chapman? Do you think it's right you're free? I see, I see a big distinction because uh, Mark Chapman was found guilty and he went, he's been in prison all these years. I was never in prison, Piers. I was in a hospital for 35 years receiving treatment. I was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to St. Elizabeth's and I received treatment all these years, and my, my family stood behind me, and I had a great lawyer, Barry Levine. And, you know, I, I feel like my, my release was very justified. But do you understand why many people feel angry? Because if you've been successful in your mission to... which is premeditated, you've already said that, if you'd succeeded in killing Reagan, you would have changed the course of American history, of global history. He turned out to be a very popular, successful president, but you would have snuffed him out at the very start of his presidency. Do you understand why some people feel enraged that you've been let out and allowed to lead a completely free life? I, I can understand that, yes. I just hope that they would also understand that I'm a completely changed man now. Uh, I just... It's, it's been so long ago that that happened, and a lot of good things have happened to me since then, to where um, I just hope people who have negative feelings about me can take another look at me and listen to my music. I tell people if they want to get to know me to listen to my songs, because uh, all of my songs are uplifting about overcoming hard times, and they can get to know me pretty well by listening to my music. I mean, you've actually you've been trying to perform live at, at music venues, but they've all been cancelled because of outcries and threats to people's lives and security issues and so on. Uh, it may be impossible for you to pursue this kind of career publicly by performing, uh, which, again, it suggests there's a lot of anger out there uh, and concern that people may take the law into their own hands because they feel that justice wasn't properly served. Well, I keep trying. I mean, you're right. I've had about five or six venues cancel on me because after the concert gets announced, they start receiving negative backlash and they back out of the concert. That's happened about six times. So I'm, I've, I'm going to keep trying, but um, hoping for a venue that will stand by me. Just to be clear about one thing, you, you did want to kill President Reagan, right? Well, I suppose, uh, suppose so back then I did. Um, I'm just so glad I didn't, I did not succeed. And obviously James Brady, as I say, died many years later from the injuries from you shooting him. He was paralyzed for life, it, it ruined his life. What are your feelings towards the Brady family who, I mean, at the very least I would imagine are pretty concerned about the fact you've been let out? Well, I just wish them all the good health in life, and I, I wish they could just forgive me. I wouldn't blame, if, wouldn't blame them if they don't forgive me, but I wish they could, because I'm sure sorry for what I did. Have you ever heard from any of the Reagan family directly? No, I've not. And all, see, all these years, I've had a court order to where I could not communicate with the victims of the shooting or their, or their families. But even now that I don't have that court order anymore, I don't, I don't think they want to hear from me, to be honest. So but, I'm just going to try and, you know, let them have their distance. OK, we're going to take a short break. John Hinckley Jr. will come back with more. My exclusive interview with the man who tried to kill a president. Welcome back to Piers Morgan uh, Uncensored from New York City. More from my exclusive interview with the man that tried to kill President Reagan. John Hinckley Jr. rejoins me now. John Hinckley... Uh, do you still take medication for the severe mental illness that you had? 
I do, Piers. I take two psychiatric medicines. And what impact do you believe the medicine has had on you? Uh, one's an antidepressant, and, you know, it, it just prevents me from getting depression, and um, I think they are effective, and I have no problem taking the medicines. When was the, the moment for you that you became aware of the enormity of what you'd done? I think after I got hospitalized, maybe about six months later, um, it all kind of just dawned on me that what I did was so terrible. And I think that was the start of my recovery. I mean, if you'd actually killed Reagan, obviously you would never have been released from prison. Have you thought about that? That's probably true. It changed security around presidents irrevocably. You know, I've been around a few uh, of the more recent presidents and the security around them is extraordinary as a result of what happened that day. What do you feel about, about guns? You obviously used a gun to cause carnage that day, nearly killed a president. It's an ongoing debate and issue in America. Do you feel there should be, as there are now, many more restrictions around the president? Do you feel there should be more restrictions around guns themselves for the wider populace? I do. I do. I, I, think, I think there are too many guns in America, to be honest. Uh, it's just kind of a very volatile time right now. And it's, it's not good that there's so many guns in America. When you did what you did, uh, John Hinckley, what was your family reaction to it? Did they stand by you? Did they disown you? My family stood by me from the first moment up till their, till their, my parents' deaths. They stood by me all the way. Your father, and I my think, brother and sister still stand by me. Your father, I think, blamed himself for what had happened. Why would he do that? I don't know, but I certainly didn't blame him. I think he said that on the stand during my trial, but I never had that feeling of blaming him. When you look back at your life, what do you think prompted such a severe mental illness that you would commit the crime you committed? I, I you know, I had a good upbringing with my family, so I think it, it was more of a chemical imbalance in my brain that caused the depression, which, which led me to get um, estranged from my family. That was another thing that happened that was too bad. It was... I got, you know, um, isolated from my family, and that was that was a, took a, it took a bad turn after that. Many Americans, I think, believe in second chances for people in in rehabilitation. Uh, some don't, but many do. But when you I mean, do, you tell people who you are because your name is very distinctive, and if they if they work out who you are, how do they react? Well, here in Williamsburg, you know, people are very nice to me, and that's the main reason I live here is I get along fine here. Uh, my name is very well known, but I've always said that, you know, my persona is not that well known. So I, I, I can go to the grocery store or to other places, and I don't get bothered. It's just, it's just that my name is so well known. There will be some people who don't think we should even do this interview. We don't think you should be given the oxygen of publicity. What do you say to them? Well, I'm glad you did because I'm trying just to get out the message that I'm a changed person. And if, if, if all these years people have had a negative image of me, I hope they can see me now as somebody who has changed a lot. I suppose the obvious... I thank you, Pierce, yep. for giving me that opportunity. Right. I mean, the obvious question, I, I guess... I would throw back at you for that, is how can we be sure you've changed? You know, as you say, you're still on medication to control your illness. What you did wasn't just a one-off, spontaneous moment of violence. It was after several years of very sinister stalking of a movie star, stalking of another uh, man who became president, uh, and then ultimately shooting Ronald Reagan. You know, there will be people watching this going, well, he may say he's changed, how can we be sure? 
Well, I would say that I have a really good track record. You know, I wasn't just released one day from the hospital. I got released over a, a number of years. My judge, you know, gave me freedom and in incremental steps to see how I would do. And I've always done well with the freedoms that he gave me. And I've proven myself to be, you know, a very peaceful person now. And that's how I plan to live my life. Do you want forgiveness? Is that, is that something you seek? And if so, who from? Sure. I think everybody wants forgiveness if they, if they need it. And just from the public at large. And from the Reagan family and from Jodie Foster, from the family of James Brady. Certainly, from I mean, the, the, the victims, yes, the victims' family, I wish, I wish so much they could forgive me. But as I, as I said earlier, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, blame them if they didn't forgive me, but I wish they would. In, in the case of James Brady, of course, as I say, he died from the uh, wounds that he suffered, um, and it was designated homicide by the coroner because of the year-and-a-day rule which existed at the time. You could not be tried for murder, but do you accept now that because you fired the gun at James Brady that caused his catastrophic injuries and subsequent death, that you were guilty of his murder? Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I certainly caused him to have devastating injuries, but um, I believe he lived on for another 30-something years. Um, so I can't really say I'm the cause of the murder. I mean, it was ruled a homicide uh, by the coroner, and he, he suffered horrendously from those injuries. He was paralyzed for the rest of his life. You did kill him, didn't you? I mean, there's no doubt about that. Ultimately, you killed him. I understand. But you accept you killed him? I would say yes. John Hinckley, uh, in the end, people will watch this interview and they may have already made their minds up about you. We're going to have a debate with, with three people with different views about this in a moment. But what is your, what's your final message, really, to viewers? who might remain unconvinced by what they're hearing and seeing and think, actually, you know what, he should, he should have stayed in prison. If John Lennon's killer is in prison, why is this guy allowed to, to be out? Well, I would say to anybody who's listening that I'm a changed person and that I was not just sitting in prison all these years not getting treatment. I've gotten, I've gotten treatment all these years. And I'm, I'm just, I don't have the same thinking that I had back then. And I've shown through the, through the freedoms I've gotten over the past 10 or 15 years that I do have a good track record of being a very good law-abiding citizen. John Hinckley, Jr., I appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.